Good morning and welcome to virtual worship at Second Congregational Church in Newcastle, United Church of Christ. As we gather ourselves for worship, we invite you to listen to our opening prelude, When Morning Gilds the Skies, with Jane Wilmot on the organ. Good morning and welcome to Second Congregational Church in Newcastle, United Church of Christ. Our church is located in Newcastle, Maine, but we are gathered and scattered as a worshiping community. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey or where you are connecting with us for worship this morning, you are a blessing to us and we are so glad that you are here. Today is the sixth Sunday of after Epiphany, and it is February 13th, 2022. We continue with our Hope and Healing Sermon series with a focus on the Gospel of Luke this morning. So we're glad to have you here for that word. This uh, word is Luke's version of the Beatitudes, and I invite you to hear and to see the words of healing in today's lesson. There is only virtual worship this morning. We continue to not have in-person worship during these COVID days. And so we uh, will continue to gather virtually only through the end of the month. 
It's our hope that we will resume our in-person and recorded hybrid worship on Ash Wednesday, March 2nd. Please continue to check in with the church office and our snippets email communications to stay up to date with our plans for reopening the building and uh, returning to our in-person and recorded worship services. Because of that determination, our annual meeting on Sunday, February 27th, will be hosted by Zoom after the virtual worship service. So uh, look for your annual report coming to you. If you haven't already received it, it will be coming by email to you. And uh, you can also call the church office and ask for us to mail you a hard copy is, if that is preferred. Continue again to stay with your snippets, email communications for further announcements. Our um, informational meeting for the annual be meeting will be held on Sunday, next Sunday, February 20th. Finally, my last two announcements are to share with you that this morning there will not be a virtual fellowship gathering on Zoom immediately after the worship service. And most importantly, we welcome your continued financial support of our ministries and worship streaming. So if you are so moved this morning, please be sure to make a contribution either by going to our website or sending in a donation or your pledge uh, through the mail. And that information can also be gathered at our website, www.secondcongo.org. Let us take this time now to center our hearts, to steady our minds, and to prepare ourselves for worship this morning. Please join me as you are able to uh, in our call to worship. For those who follow God's ways, they are like trees planted by water. They bring forth fruit in due season, and they never wither or fail. Delight in God's teachings. Meditate on the scriptures day and night. For God watches over the righteous. Life is found in living God's ways. Let us now sing together our opening hymn, Like a Tree Beside the Waters.
please join me in the prayer of invocation. Spirit of life, turn us away from day-to-day -day living and remind us that we are eternal people. Guide us to the places of rest and respite. Remind us that we are not machines who consume and produce, but living, holy beings in need of tender love and care. Guide us into the ways of healing and wholeness that require justice work, and lead us into your peace. Spirit of life, breathe on us, move us, and show us the way, the truth, and the life through Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they excuse you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. You know, this scripture reminds me of yet another African-American hero that is in our American history that we need to know a little bit more about, and that is Amelia Boynton Robinson. She was born in 1911, and she was very active in the women's suffrage move movement at a very early age. As young as 10 years old, she would go with her mother to meetings after her mom got out of work as a seamstress. She went on to technical school and to a college and be, began a study in home economics. And she, in 1934, at the age of 23, she became a registered voter, which was quite a feat for the African American people living in Savannah, Georgia. And the reason is because they had to take literacy tests before they even had the privilege 
of being able to attempt to register to vote. She then used her status as a registered voter to assist other African American applicants to become registered voters. She married in 1936 Sam Boyton and together they went from rural town to rural town teaching economics, home economics, how to run businesses and also how to go about preparing oneself for voting. It was very important work, very hard work. And she had this sign in one of her business offices that said, a voteless people is a hopeless people. And she devoted her life to ensuring that African American people would be able to vote their voice. In 1963, her husband Sam died. And in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. And she used that act in order to directly challenge the Crow, Jim Crow laws in Alabama. She became the first African American and the first woman to run for a seat in Congress in representing Alabama. She did not win the bid, but she did garner 10% of the vote when only 5% of the population were registered African Americans. She was also instrumental in the Selma March in 1965. She was the one that reached out to Martin Luther King Jr. and invited him and other leaders to come to Alabama and plan the march, and her home became their planning headquarters. And in March 1965, they made their march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and history was made on the day that became known as Bloody Sunday. Amelia was severely injured in that march. She was beaten and left for dead, but she did not give up. She returned to the second march when they were turned around yet again. And on March 21st, 1965, she was part of the delegation that successfully marched to, from Selma to Montgomery, and 25,000 people joined the march as a result of her courage, her bravery, and her commitment to voting rights, civil rights, and human rights. Amelia went on to be recognized for all the work that she did in the hope and work of humanity. And she ended up being honored in 2014 for her work. Amelia died just after her 96th birthday in 2015. In a week when our Supreme Court has has struggled with supporting voting rights in Alabama and disappointed today's African American voters. It is right for us to remember the work and the courage of Amelia Boynton Robinson and to remember that she too was a disciple for justice and for transforming hearts. Thank you. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, for the ways in which you speak to us, all the manners in which you are present to us, and all the ways in which you bring healing to our lives, then, now, forever, and always. Amen.
So as we know, there are times when things just aren't as they appear to be. When we get up close and personal and take a better look, we discover a different reality below the surface of things. This was true for Patrick Lawler. In 2005, he was a construction worker who thought that he simply had a bad toothache. For six days, he tried painkillers and ice packs to reduce the swelling around a tooth. And when nothing he did brought relief, he finally went to the dentist's office. And it was only after the dentist had taken an x-ray did Patrick learn the true source of his pain. He had a four-inch nail embedded in his head. There, you see, there had been an accident six days earlier. Patrick had been working at a job site with a nail gun when the tool recoiled, hitting him in the face. A nail had gone into the wood that he was working with, so there was no reason for him to search for a missing nail. But what Patrick didn't realize was that a second nail had also misfired, and it had ricocheted and shot into the roof of his mouth. It was now embedded in his skull, piercing his brain, and having just missed the internal side of his right eye. After the accident, Patrick had only complained of a toothache and some blurred vision, even trying ice cream to soothe the pain. After the nail was discovered, the medical issues were now much more evident, certainly very urgent, and the risk of more harm and even death were even more dire. And Patrick was rushed to the Denver hospital where surgeons successfully removed the nail after five hours of careful surgery. One neurosurgeon admitted, this is the second time we've seen this type of accident at this hospital when the person was injured by a nail gun and didn't actually realize that the nail had entered their skull. Go figure. As I said in the beginning, Things aren't always what they appear to be, and often the truth is stunning and hard to believe. Like Patrick, we often need the wisdom, skills, and diagnostic tools of experts to help us see what the true nature of a problem is if we are able to be healed. The problem with self-diagnosis is that we are often limited by our own view of reality. We might think it's a toothache, but in fact, it's something much more serious. We think ice cream or pills will soothe the pain when really deeper, more precise work is necessary. As one physician said, he who has himself as a doctor has a fool for a patient. Today's scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke brought this story to my mind because I tend to think of Luke's version of the Beatitudes much like a type of spiritual x-ray. Jesus is the doctor or healer in this case, and he's acutely aware that there is pain and suffering of every kind in mind, body, spirit, and also in the community. Jesus sees it all, even as the disciples can't. He also sees that it's just not in one place, but everywhere, and he knows that healing is urgently needed. And so he's been going from town to town, speaking words of truth about God and healing people of their diseases and their diseases. Jesus' ministry was growing, and the crowds were expanding, and he called forward 12 disciples from the multitudes to work with him. And it's this point in Jesus' healing ministry, Luke explains that he has stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people. They had again come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and even those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. People recognized Jesus' healing power, and they were all trying to touch him. They wanted to be close to the one who could accurately diagnose what ailed them and then heal them. 
They longed to be healed of their pain because so far nothing else had worked, not even ice cream. And this is when Jesus takes his spiritual x-ray and reveals what he sees and where the true problems are among the people. Jesus directs his words to the disciples as they are the ones who have freely committed to following Jesus. And because this is how and where the urgent work of healing begins right now. Jesus is intent on focusing their sight, not on just what they perceived alongside him, but he also wants the disciples to see and understand the whole picture. These beatitudes are instructions for them to look closely. He's telling them, see for yourselves who needs healing, what needs to be healed, and what will happen if the healing doesn't begin now, right now. As Jesus turns his gaze upon the disciples, we all can plainly see that things are not as they appear to be. And so we ask, what does Jesus see that the disciples don't see? What is it that we don't see either? Because Jesus sees the whole truth. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the hurting. Blessed are those who are hated because of me. Jesus clearly points out that God's blessing, the makarios, that sense of eternal unity with God, is upon those who are literally poor, living in poverty and without food. And what catches us off guard about these blessings is that Jesus comes to challenge what we see from the other side, the side that many of us can more easily relate to. He says that woe will befall those who are economically well-off, well-fed, well-minded, and well-known. Luke wants us to understand that Jesus' ministry is about social justice and mission. It's about truly caring for the needs of our neighbors and doing something about those who are not well. And Jesus goes deeper with that diagnosis as he is pointing directly at what he sees, the physical realities, in this case, poverty, hunger, hunger and need, and that these are only symptomatic of where the true hurt or woe is. It's the hearts of the ones who are rich, well-fed, happy, and popular who are in need of healing right now. It's an eye-opening challenge. Often, we as Jesus' disciples see all the hurt that is right in front of us And yet we do nothing but stand on the level place with Jesus and stare. We do comparatively little as we allow the poor to be poor, the hungry to be hungry, the hurting to keep on hurting. We're afraid of what the cost for us will be if we do help because we are content with our own well-being. In these few contrasting statements of blessings and woes, Jesus has taken a snapshot of our human predicament while looking up to the disciples and us as if to say, what are you doing right this minute? People are sick and dying right here, and they're tormented by hurt and unclean spirits. Will you get down here with me and help? The situation is dire. The festering wounds will only get worse if something isn't done. Full-blown care and compassion are needed right now. Do you see? Do you see? Jesus is telling us the truth of our lives as he sees us. 
Jesus sees it all, gets right down in it, and squarely levels with us, pointing the way. Help the poor. Help the hungry. Help the hurting. It won't be the popular thing, but it will be God's thing. And woe to the rich, the well-fed, the happy and popular, if your hearts do not change. Eugene Peterson's biblical paraphrasing of these woe passages helps to get to the meaning of these verses for our modern times. He puts it this way, but it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself, for yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think that life's all fun and games as there's suffering to be met, and you will meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. Friends, Things are not always as they seem to be in the world, in our lives, in our church community. With great care and devotion and love, we worry about whether our budget will be balanced. We fret about worship attendance and monetary income, and we are deeply concerned and committed our church leaders, who are also deeply devoted, meet for hours on end, matching dollars to fixed costs and seeking return value for ministry expenses. They're such good stewards. Many of us don't even see or know much about these things as the church building is closed and the church life seems suspended these days. We've stepped back from interaction and responsibilities in the stress and exhaustion and constant worry of COVID and political upheaval. We've gotten out of our Christian practices. Yet when we take a good look as a congregation, four things are quite evident. We are rich in so many ways. We are well fed by our nurture of one another. We are content with our building and our ministries as they are. And our church is popular in the community. These aren't bad things, and the worries we have about keeping the momentum going and appearances up are truly human and normal. Yet Jesus also challenges us. Our task here at Second Church is not to be popular, not to be satisfied, but to be true. God startles us with this uncomfortable truth. We are being called to action to bring hope and healing to a hurting world. We are being inspired by our faith to take action right here and right now. Jesus is our model for love and compassion and clearly offers us a way to healing and wholeness for all people and for us to be a blessing to others th that we long for. We are called to help the poor, feed the hungry, help the hurting. Don't count the cost. And oh, Second Church family, I remind you that we are called to do the same. These Beatitudes are calling us to see our lives in God's world, our world, with new eyes and transformed hearts. Eyes that follow Jesus and hearts that are true. Jesus sees plainly what needs healing. Blessed are the ones who can live in this upside-down world of God, 
for them the kingdom of God is revealed. And woe to us if we miss the opportunity to be part of such healing and blessing. As we prepare for our annual meeting in two weeks and plan for the upcoming program year, I pray that we will be bold and truly live into upside down thinking and acting. Regardless of budget constraints, COVID complaints, and the fact that we're all aging saints, may we come to see that we truly are a blessing. And I want you to know and to see and to truly believe that you are the ones who can bring hope and healing to our world right here, right now. God ordains it, and Jesus sees it. Jesus knows what the needs of healing are and will point us the way. May our hearts be true and our vision set on serving God's kingdom now. Amen. Let us now sing the hymn, O Christ the Healer.
let us take this time now to enter into a time of focused prayer. I offer these words for the prayers of the people, which will then be followed by a time of silent prayer for all of you. Trusted God, in this parched pandemic landscape where we have all been exiled into uncertainty and constant change, it's difficult to send our roots into streams of your living water. We are distracted and overwhelmed, flitting from one undone task, one fraught decision, one fresh worry to the next. We are like the deer panting for water. Our soul longs for you. Be our divining rod, O God, leading us to the spiritual streams of support that you so graciously provide. Fountain of life, in your perfect world no sword is drawn except for the sword of righteousness. Be with those who live in fear of war and violence. Bless those whose borders are threatened by a powerful enemy military. Gather all your people under the banner of peace so we might come to know each other and love each other as we have been called. May all rumors of war be dispelled in favor of your path of truth and justice and peace. O oh God, you are she who provides, and we beg for you to heal those who are hostage to violence and threats of violence. Calm the traumatized, the victimized, the oppressed. Ground those who are helpless and spinning. Renew those who are weary and overwhelmed. Heal those who are suffering and sick. Love and comfort those who are grieving. Help those who are hungry and have no bed. And gather us together, nurturing one, so we can learn to be tender and merciful with one another and with ourselves. In this prayer time, we also seek your care for that which is on our hearts. O oh God, united as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you, our healer, our comforter, and our peacemaker. Amen. And as we continue to pray, we remember that often just saying thank you is prayer enough. And so we take this time to say thank you to God for all the blessings that have been bestowed upon our lives today and yesterday and this past week. We ask that we continue to receive so that we might be able to give, for we have enough and we are called to share what we can, our gifts, our talents, our love, our mercy, and our treasure. So as we remember these things, may we be so moved to share them, giving thanks to God and committing to passing the blessings on to others. Let us sing together now our doxology. we lift up our prayer of thanksgiving. God, you have sustained us and led us to sources of living water. Take these gifts and multiply their blessings for those who are hungry, hurting, and in need of your strength. Amen. And now let us sing together our closing hymn, 
I've got peace like a river. today's time of worship, we have proclaimed the presence and power of the risen Christ with the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. Now, as we go forth, let us demonstrate the presence and power of the risen Christ with the deeds of our hands and the labor of our lives, and may our witness bring healing and peace to God's beloved world. Amen. This concludes this morning's worship service. We will not be gathering this morning for our virtual fellowship this week, so I encourage you to simply go and share love with others. Happy Valentine's Day. Take care. <laughs>